Hey everybody. Let's get the attendees coming in. Hey Abhishek, hey Demetrius, hey Eric, Evan, Greg. Good to see you again, Greg. Tom, good to see you again. Jennifer, Carsten. There he is. The man himself. Yeah, what's up, man? How are you doing? Yeah, hanging out. It's all good. Good. Yeah, in so, my cabin life. Oh, whereabouts are you? I'm outside of Asheville, North Carolina, in the middle of nowhere. Like, nice. Yeah, we had that uh, same I kind of idea when Isabella, my eldest, started school. We just kind of like moved out into the hills, into like a little village. Now, yeah, now it's paid off. Normally, I'm in Mexico City, um, which yep. I love. Uh, but you know, uh, during COVID, we just uh, kind of pulled the ripcord and <laughs> worked remotely from uh, you know a little town, get some good hiking, that sort of stuff. Nice. Yeah, I love all that sort of stuff. How long have you been there now? Since May. Uh, yeah. So. Gotcha. The one remote work, eh? Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah, I think we might be going back in a month or two, but uh, we'll see. Nice. Cool. Well, um, just give it like a few minutes. We usually give it about five minutes for people to filter in. They're just getting notifications and emails and stuff. Um, so, yeah, we'll let everyone filter in. Cool. A few familiar names here. Hey, Dan. Uh, hey, Greg, obviously. Paul. Tom, Ulysses, Jennifer, how are you doing? All right, so today we're going to be talking about early stage investing, bootstrapping, taking money, not taking money, building products, no code, why it's good, different opportunities, and loads of, we're going to be taking loads of Q&A. So if you have any questions on like the tip of your tongue now that you're just like eager to answer, um, drop them into the Q and A um, panel just so we can keep track of them. Uh, there's about 170 people registered for this so far, so if you put them in chat, they might get lost. But log them into the Q and A, and we can get to them. You see, thanks for doing this first time signing in live. Good to see you. Thank you. Demetrius, a friend of mine is probably very close to you. Been raising chickens since COVID started. Yeah. yeah. Tyler's actually an undercover that. chicken farmer, yeah. early stage chicken farm investor. You know, I, I have I have taken up uh, wood chopping, actually. That's been my thing because you know, there's a lot of trees around here. A lot of people make a lot of fires. We're up in the mountains, so it's still quite cold at night. And uh, I got a chainsaw and an axe. Uh, those are my presents to myself this summer. So <laughs> nice. Did you get like a matching much. shirt and stuff, or? Yeah, <laughs> no, just regular clothes. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Carl, you need a bigger beard for that, Tyler. That, that is fair. Yeah. Yeah, fair. he's just he's just starting out. To be fair, so give him a, give him a few more months. Yeah. It's surprisingly easy, I have to say. Like I watched YouTube for about an hour and then went and started taking down trees with an ax and a chainsaw and it was not that. Whoa, yeah. nice. Yeah. But your partner's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's the wonders of YouTube. Yeah, she was definitely skeptical, but. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay, so five past, we got 28 people in. I think people will filter in over the next few minutes. So I guess we can get started and then, yeah, we can do a bunch of Q&A and we'll be stopping and starting so people can join in whenever they like. So introducing uh, Tyler. Tyler is a founder of Ernest Capital, um, founder and general partner of Ernest Capital, providing funding for bootstrappers mainly focused on early stage investing, targeting, building calm, profitable, sustainable companies. I think that's a key thing that we like to get across. And I'm going to ask you about that in a second. Um, but also you focus on like building a community of founders and mentors, which I know Ben, the founder of Makerpad, he's benefits from this a lot because it's kind of, you built this whole support network around early stage founders who are, although early stage, kind of at different periods, in the whole process so you can kind of 
help each other along. I think that's a, a really good model and the, also that the value of community comes through quite, quite clearly in this. Um, so that was kind of an intro taken from the recent podcast you did from us. And to that point, you'd invested in 13 companies so far and you're about a year old. Is that still, still the same? And was that intro accurate to start with? Yeah, it's accurate. Yeah. I mean, so we do funding for bootstrappers. It's, it's kind of an oxymoron, but you know, the point is, you know, we're writing checks, we're investing in companies, you know, very early stage, but we're not a traditional VC fund where, you know, we're writing this check and then we want you to raise more and more and more capital and try to become a billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we write early stage checks and then the idea is from there, um, the kind of plan A is to just build a, a profitable, sustainable company. You can raise more capital if you want. We're not opposed to it. But, you know, the, the general gist is you're pretty much building like as if you were a bootstrapper, um, but you need a little bit of capital early on. Classic example, you know, uh, Ben was building MakerPad as a side project while he actually worked for us. Um, and, you know, being able to quit your job and then also take with you a little bit of capital gives you that cushion to confidently go out and do stuff like hire amazing people <laughs> who are also in the ecosystem <laughs> and want to work with them. Um, and so that's kind of basically what we do. Um, we have invested in 20 companies since we launched, which was February of last year. So about 18 months ago. Uh, and we also just um, launched and raised our second uh, fund uh, for Ernest. So we are continuing to be in business and uh, got plenty of money to invest in companies these days. So. Nice. So why, why bootstrappers? Why are you looking at this stage of the journey in particular? Kind of what led you to this point? Yeah, I mean, two things. Um, one, it's, it's the trajectory where I found success. I mean, I, uh, earlier in my career, um, you know, kind of the very first time I ever started to become an entrepreneur, I basically um, came to that because I had, I had a background working in the clean tech industry. I saw an opportunity in the solar market and I said, uh, you know, I'm going to build software to help people put solar on their homes. Um, started building software, realized like, Hey, you know, I need more people and more money than I have. So I guess I should go raise VC. Um, and essentially spent a ton of time pitching VCs and, and realizing that, you know, while I had a good business plan, we didn't have any roadmap to like a $10 billion company. And, and so we just weren't a fit for VCs. And then later I bootstrapped a B2B SaaS business. I wrote about it on the internet. A lot of people can find it, um, but it was really success successful for me, but the early stage like sucked. I mean, I had a huge amount of credit card debt. That was what financed the first year of, of getting that business off the ground. And so when I sold that last company, I started thinking about, hey, there's this whole ton of businesses that people are trying to build. They could use some early stage funding. And on top of that, you know, community, mentors, all this stuff that is pointed around the idea of building these sustainable, profitable businesses. Because, you know, you, you Google like, you know, customer acquisition strategies and, you know, 99 of the first 100 results are going to presume that you have $5 million in venture capital to sort of deploy, right? So, yeah. so how do you get good advice and mentorship if you're not doing that? Um, and so that was just the kind of space in the market that we were like, well, there's not really anyone doing this, so let's do it. Got it. Makes complete sense. Um, so just a question for everybody here listening today. Who is currently working on a project or has an idea and it's kind of in the stage where they don't know if they can either build it themselves or you need to take funding to pay somebody else to build it for you because this is going to lead on to another topic we're going to talk about which is no code so anybody fitting in that spot in the moment okay tom i'm actually trying to monetize my 80k community at the moment with no code tools Nice, a good start. 80K in the community, jeez. Okay, Amit. <laughs> good one. Yeah, 80K, jeez. Uh, a small business, some back end functionality needs some version of a front end built. Okay. Just going to give us like an idea of which way we can go with this. Definitely building something that's a struggle without any funding. Okay, might have to uh, address, address the why there. Yeah. I mean, I think, would it be helpful to sort of just speak to like, you know, wh why we're having this webinar, right? Like, I mean, I can just mm. give a little, 
spiel yeah, on that's this. Good. That's a good so, point. So, so basically, you know, you and I were talking about this because I was sort of on Twitter talking about how I see a lot of entrepreneurs um, these days who have an idea for a business. And oftentimes it might even be a pretty good idea, right? It might be something where they have an insight into a market or they have a particular, you know, view on something that's, that's fairly unique and they have a good idea for business. And the first thing that they do is they go and try to start raising money, right? And so they, they come to me and they say, Hey, look, you know, we're raising 500 K pre-seed and pre-seed is a sort of term that goes around for like, just literally you got nothing right? Like you're just an idea and some people and you want to raise money. And that's like officially classified as pre-seed. Um, and they show up saying, Hey, I want to raise 500k pre-seed. And, you know, first of all, the thing I try to, you know, really tell people is like, in general, even though pre-seed is like, quote unquote, a thing, there's about 2000 pre-seed deals done every year, Should which is to say what, um, like a pre-seed and seed investment is just in case as somebody here or a few people in here which aren't familiar with any kind of VC investment lingo at all. Yeah, I'll try to keep it succinct, but essentially for a long time you had this idea of seed investing, like a series A is your first real venture round. Mm -hmm. And so anything prior to that was considered like angel and seed investing. Okay. And that used to be 10, 15 years ago, that was, you know, two people probably like Stanford grads with like a PowerPoint and that was it, you know, that was seed investing. And then what happened was it became a lot easier to launch a business. Mm -hmm. And so all the seed investors started saying, look, we don't invest in, you know, two people on a PowerPoint anymore. We invest in, we want to see traction. We want to see you launch the product. We want to see some early users, some early revenue, and that's what we're going to invest in. And that's also where Ernest really invests. So it's like you launch the business, you've got maybe a couple thousand a month in revenue, and you're looking yeah. for money to go full time or make your first hires and that sort of stuff. That's kind of broadly the idea of seed investing. Got so it. then there was this white space where you had some truly exceptional people, right? Who, you know, they have a background in the industry. They're coming off of Ten, the example I always use is like, you grew up working in the hotel business, you're an, a, a small investor in a boutique hotel, and you just spent eight years as a VP at Airbnb, and now you're going to go build hotel software, right? It's like, oh, okay, this person is obviously going to raise a seed round. So some people will start doing pre-seed investing. Literally, the day they quit their job, they're like, here's a check, get started, let's go. Point is, basically nobody does this, right? There's only 2000 deals done in the whole market every year in pre-seed. So for all intents and purposes, practically nobody raises money as a person with an idea anymore, right? And that's the point I try to get across. And I think it doesn't really filter into the zeitgeist right now that although it is a thing, almost nobody can do it. And so if you're at the pre-seed stage, as in you basically just have an idea, what you really should be doing is not fundraising. Right. What you really should be doing is trying to figure out a way to launch a product, validate it, get revenue, get feedback from customers. And, and one of the main tools to do that, in my opinion, is to use like no code stuff. And so that was kind of the, the, the impetus. <laughs> for yeah, cool. So the, yeah. you, 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 timing earnest with the explosion of no code tools was, I don't know, is it either lucky or good or the combination of the both because no, it's kind of coming it's like a great, of, great spot yeah, it's part of what we do i mean a, a core sort of thesis behind what we do is that nowadays you can and what i mostly encourage people to do is to bootstrap through the phase up to where we invest yeah. right so i don't in i think 99 times out of 100 with most business ideas you do not need a million dollars to get to a few thousand dollars a month in revenue yeah. Right? You can actually build something that people can start to pay for and start to generate traction without any outside capital. And that changes the game in a lot of ways. And no code is a big part of that. Another part of it would be just like really good programming frameworks like, you know, Rails or bullet train on top of Rails. And so you basically have all this code done for you and you only have to customize a small part of it. Um, and so that lets people get to the phase where we want to invest without already having raised a ton of money from other VCs essentially. Mm. So it's, it's, it's part of what we do. And when you look at the companies we invested in, you'll see a like combination of companies built entirely off of no code, which would be like Bakerpad or um, Yaluchi, which is a marketplace for hairstyling services. Mm -hmm. You will see uh, people building stuff for no coders. So like member space is a big one yep. for being able to charge members and stuff like that. And then you'll see, um, 
kind of mixtures of the two, like an example would be cool to pick apart later is like Hostify, which is SaaS, but um, is a solo founder and, and they built the entire like front end billing, authentication, everything just on WordPress with no code tools. And then there's this little slice of yeah. like code, you know, for, for the first version, right? But, you know, um, yeah. yeah that's so, great. Love it. Yeah. So let's take a couple of questions. So first one from Greg, um, is there a path you prescribe from start for startups that are still pre-revenue, but considering earnest capital for down the road, what milestones should we, would you, should we be aiming for? Uh, good question. So, I mean, so, so one of the things, so one of the things we have is we launched a product called Trailhead. Um, which we created. It's also a no-code product in and of itself. I basically hacked it together with uh, Airtable and ConvertKit and Zapier and a bunch of other stuff. But at the end of the day, it basically is a way to get started um, working through some of the questions that you would kind of want to know. And, and the goal is for them to be both things that we will want to know, but that are also useful for founders, right? So it's like thinking through, okay, competition. We don't just say like, tell us about your competition. Here's a form field. It's like, here's how to think about competition. Here's some good reading about competition. Here are some prompts that if you just sat down and like journal them would be useful for thinking about your business. By the way, also, if you want to tell us what you think about competition, here's a way to do that. And so that's actually structured to be something you can do on your own time uh, that will start to help you build the product and then get to the point where we um, also have enough information to invest once you kind of get to that moment mm -hmm. um the rest of it is sort of like kind of what we're doing here which is just like hey like keep bootstrapping here's some ideas on how to sort of um you know keep making progress prior to to capitals absolutely i've just put the link um to earnest capital trailhead in the chat for everybody so yeah highly advise if you're in the same thinking as greg go and go through that link there um question for evan uh, when can when we get to no-code tools, how hard is it to learn these from scratch? Are there good firms that are skilled at doing this for you at a decent price? Um, so, you, yeah, I might be able to yeah. ask this. Uh, yeah, you can. You, anyone could learn how to use no-code tools. There, there obviously is different ones fitting into different categories, and obviously there's ones which suit more technical people, but there is just as many for non-technical people. So... There is ones, for instance, that my mum could use, or there's probably some that my six-year-old daughter could use and drag components onto a screen and then change the text. So for instance, building a card site is as easy as dragging a folder across the screen on your PC. Um, also on the flip side to that is, so you can actually create something yourself, whether it is the final product, um, it doesn't always have to be that, but you can kind of get down the road to a certain point, whatever it is you're trying to build, whether that is a landing page connected to an email responder, which has information about what you're trying to build, or whether that's some information going into an air table and that air table being like embedded on a site. So you have like some form of directory of resources. I know this is like a really common product. So if, there's something which is not documented very well, maybe like a niche of um, destinations or services that aren't documented well on the web, just pulling these in together and you can actually build a really simple products really quickly. On the flip side of that, you can build very advanced products using no code tools. If you go through some learning materials on Makepad, it's probably a good place to go. Um, so the entirety of Makepad, for instance, is built with no-code tools, um, just using uh, Webflow, Zapier, Airtable, MemberStack, and then some others embedded in there. But yeah, yeah. there are also say, firms now. Yeah, I was going to say that I think that there, while anybody can use no-code tools, like I, so we are sort of power users of no-code at Ernest, and we have a a uh, person who is on staff who is like a no coder um, because we use so much of that that it's actually like uh, it usually started off with me uh, when Ben was working with me he was doing this stuff and then I was taking over it but it was like there's enough complexity there that there are certain people who I think think about it in a way that's almost similar to programming like if you really can think in systems and stuff like that um, you can be quite a bit better at using these tools than you know just a random person even though the random person could get there eventually and I think many people if you're really in a moment where you're like I want to launch a product 
but I don't have the money to hire a development. I got a hundred thousand dollar quote from a development shop. I think it's really worth considering. A lot of people should talk about hiring a no coder to build something that's like, Hey, this is going to be kind of a prototype. Mm -hmm. It's maybe not going to, you know, scale to a hundred thousand users, but it's going to work good enough that people will pay you money for it. And it can be done for a fraction of the time and probably a a substantial fraction of the cost as well. Um, I think a lot of people should think about that. Yeah. So one example I like to give was a freelance project I did maybe like six months ago, somebody local to me, they put a job on one of the gig sites and they were looking to build a, a marketplace to connect people who are lonely with people who are willing to accept people in around like celebration times like Christmas, for instance. Um, they had a quote from a development shop to bring a two-sided marketplace with messaging and payments and logins for £60,000 and four months of work. I wow. use ShareTribe. I charged them like a tiny fraction of that and built it in four hours. I think it took me to build it and handed it to them to the next the next day, and they're just blown away because they were they're people who were going from an idea in their head, which they don't know, they don't care if it's built with code or without code or hand coded from scratch with a development shop and a design team. They just yeah. want they just want like something like a product, the idea that works. So. Yeah. What's the benefits of no code? What what's the state of finding those kinds of people on MakerPad right now? Can you is there a job board or how can you do that? Uh yeah, we've got a job board on MakerPad. It's actually freshly rolled out by Ben, our uh, serial product speed builder, creator. He builds everything. Yeah. Um so we're looking at full-time jobs on there and also going to be posting gig work on there soon. Um actually, we for a limited time. Love it. Okay. Yeah, we also seem to, I think it is all okay, um, put somebody from our community who's been in our community for a while as the second no-coder into On Deck. So we did some sessions with On Deck in the, for the last four weeks, and Brandon over there runs the operations. He is a serial no-coder as well and runs their operations using Zapier, like heavy Zapier user and Airtable. And now he's the bottleneck of like creating all these automations and everything, even though he's probably his automations are enabling enabling him to do the work of say five to 10 people on like the admin side. He now needs somebody to come in and support him. So we put put somebody in there uh, from the MakerPad community. So there is real work and real money to be earned through learning these, these tools. I always say that just learning how to automate simple tasks using Zapier, is is a full time a full time income for anybody who knows it. So, question from UCs, uh, Tyler. What is what is some cr- criteria that you use for investing in businesses that you believe other founders should adopt when evaluating a business opportunity? Uh, so, I mean, we think through a lot of the stuff that's not particularly unique to us in terms of you know competitive advantage and market size and things like that. So I'll focus on the things that I think are sort of unique to me um, and and that I think maybe some entrepreneur should should consider. Um, I actually did a pretty lengthy discussion on this. Uh, it was sort of framed as a debate, although we ended up agreeing a lot more than disagreeing uh, with Justin Jackson on the interview on the Indie Hackers podcast. So mm-hmm. if, you, if you search for me and Justin Jackson, Indie Hackers, you'll find it. But essentially, you know, I think a lot of folks should be looking in interesting niches um, in the economy more so than trying to tackle these big, massive things, right? So I see a lot of folks. Um, coming with one of the things I'm seeing a lot is just like HR software, right? So it's just like manage your remote team, full stop, right? And it's just like, this is such a huge market. It's very competitive. You know, I usually say that if you're going to be a bootstrapper, you're not going to raise a ton of venture capital. You're going to either work with us or you're going to just kind of go it alone. You need some sort of competitive advantage on distribution or differentiation, right? Mm-hmm. And differentiation is just like your product is better than the other products and distribution is you have some good, cheap, highly effective way at getting your product out there. That can be a community that you've built yourself. That can be just deeply understanding the market and having good contacts there, et cetera. And those are a lot easier if you are going to build, you know, uh, a, a very niche workflow tool for post-production studios because you happen to have worked in that industry your whole life. 
life than if you're going to build a tool for running remote companies, right? And so I think, um, I think a lot of people should consider that. And it's something that we look for. It's, it's part of our investing strategies to invest in stuff that is probably overlooked by um, folks trying to build billion dollar companies um, because you can build like really, really effective, profitable businesses in these, these niches. Um, there's sort of like uh, somebody coined like Patio 11's law, um, Patrick McKenzie, which is essentially like the universe of all the people out there making like $10 million a year as a team of three people building like these kinds of technology tools is 10 times larger than you can imagine, even when you factor in Patio 11's law, right? It's just like, it, 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 there's so many people out there building these great profitable companies that you just can't fathom it. And so people just get too sucked into these big center of gravities of huge markets that are obviously right in front of your face instead of trying to go find something where you have underserved customers that are just like desperate for solutions that you can differentiate because you're the only game in town, right? Uh, Got it. So. Got it. Yeah. That may be worth explaining. Um, I was going to ask at the beginning of this, what you define as a calm business. So now it's like a unique word that you use to replace another word. <laughs> yeah. Sense. I mean, it, it, it is very, it's very squishy, right? I mean, it, it essentially, um, we, our whole strategy is focused around, having maximizing the number of entrepreneurs that we invest in that succeed, that reach some level of, of success, right? The business becomes profitable on an ongoing basis. They can continue to do it. They're paying their employees, their customers are happy, et cetera. And one of the main things I think that kills companies is basically, you know, a bunch of different words that are the inverse of calm, right? It's like founder burnout, employee burnout. You were trying to grab too much market share too fast. So you hired too aggressively. You spent too much money on Facebook ads, et cetera, et cetera. Here's all this uncalm stuff, which blew up an otherwise good idea that could have been a good business. And so mm -hmm. calm for us is about sort of um, growing at a sustainable pace, um, you know, uh, hiring at a reasonable pace, like just generally optimizing to not blow up your company along the way to success, essentially. Um, and, and it's just, you know, we try to, we try to be a comp company and uh, to, to sort of invest in those kinds of founders as well. Nice. On that sort of vein, uh, Tom had a question. Um, what traction specifically are you looking for when investing? Product market fit or is there a level of revenue you need to see before it's something that would be of interest to Ernest? So, yeah, I think um, that's a really interesting one because it could be, is it like $500 a month or is it like $1,000 a month or is it so many customers? Yeah, I'll drop a link in the chat here, which is what we would sort of describe like what we invest in. There's a bit in there about the stage. Um, so it's usually we are looking for something that indicates as a real business here. And the way I usually describe it is there's like three buckets and we want some sort of an answer in all three of those, which is, can you build it? Um, will people pay for it? And can you grow it? And so we're looking for like a minimum viable answer in all of those, right? So can you build it is like, you know, are you not just like hemorrhaging cash to an outsourced developer shop to do everything, right? Have you have the team to build it, whether that's no code or code or whatever, you know, have you figured out how to sort of build the product? Um, will people pay for it? It's just like, is there some evidence that there is a group of people out there that will pay like a reasonable price for this that we believe can build a business? Often what that adds up to, um, and so the third piece is just like, can you grow it? Do you have like at least one channel that's not just like, oh, my 10 friends, you know, all signed up for it. Like, you know, reasonable arm's length people are finding your product saying like, yes, this is good. I would like to pay for it. Uh, can be just one channel to start, you know, it doesn't have to be a bunch. And, and what that usually adds up to is like at least about a thousand dollars a month, right? Because if you've got people paying for it and you can show that there is growth, you know, usually at a minimum, that is you're growing by a couple of hundred dollars a month month for a couple of months and and okay we can all agree you've got a pretty good answer to all three of these buckets um so yeah usually it's in the most of our investments are in the realm of a couple thousand dollars of monthly revenue um mm -hmm. going down to like 
1k a month at like the very very edge i would say yeah got it is there anybody here in in the chat that is sort of in that space at the moment maybe like five hundred dollars to like a thousand dollars a month or even before that are you thinking about like trying to build out your product with no code tools we kind of don't know where to go from here because this is probably the next thing we're going to move on to is some ideas about how you can actually build it out yourself if you want to reply to everybody, I've just noticed in the chat by default, it just sends your messages to us. Okay, yeah. You might have to just change the blue box to send it to all panelists and attendees in the chat. Do so yeah, does anybody in the thinks like the earnest capital sweet spot of a thousand pound, a thousand dollars a month in revenue? Pounds or dollars are fine. We don't discriminate. Uh, pesos. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Working towards it, nice. Okay, nice, Carsten. I'm use. I want to hear more about. I'm using Airtable, and we'll try to compete with Amazon. That is ambitious. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you got the chat earlier. Yeah, I think um, the issue there might be number of rows. I think you, I've capped our Airtable a few times at fifty thousand rows. So I think if you compete with Amazon, you might need a bigger database. Is and you might hit a rate limit issue if you're calling Airtable on that sort of scale. Uh, no code sounds like a counter movement. Let's find a name that doesn't include negations, shall we? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of discussion around the word no code. Um, scaling up from a no code base seems like a potential bottom, bottleneck. How much of, of that is a legit concern and how do you handle scaling in that context without having to redo everything with code, for instance? Do you want I think to it's first? I've got an answer yeah. as well. I think it's a good question. So uh, the, my first answer is, I think it's very surprising how far you can get before you have to refactor some of those things. So okay. like if you are strapping yourself to a rocket ship and you're going to make a free tool that you're going to just like launch on product times and like, you know, pump a ton of people through it and you are expecting hundreds of thousands of users right out of the gate. Yeah, that's a serious concern. If you're going to have a product that you're going to charge people money for and it's going to be reasonably high value and you, you know, you can build like a real business with a thousand users, let's say you charge $50 a month. That's a serious business with a thousand users, right? So um, if you're doing something closer to that, um, you know, usually you really just don't hit those limits of no code. It, it, it's much more about like your internal development processes than it is like the tools actually breaking. Uh, you feel like, oh, okay, actually it's, it's now taking us longer to build these new features in no code uh, just because of the limits of how many products we have to bring together and that sort of stuff. Uh, so now it starts to make sense to sort of refactor it into a, a you know, a, a code mm -hmm. a software product. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I don't think that's a huge concern. I, I, I strongly would encourage folks to take that risk to build something with no code, get it out there, get traction, get revenue on it. That would, that's ideal. Yeah. Um, and then cross that bridge when you come to it, because, Hey, you'll have that revenue to be able to hire a developer rather than, you know, paying for it out of your savings or something. So. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, just to add to that, I can see Ben is actually in the chat here. So this is going to lend us, lend itself to the current situation. We've got to, um, at Makeup, where we've got so far now that we are, like a sustainable business, as you know, Tyler. Um, we've got multiple of us working on the project. Um, and we've now got to a stage where we've kind of pushed our no-code stack to the limit. Um, but at this point, we have on our site, on, which is built on Webflow and Airtable, we have hundreds of tutorials, hundreds of hours of video content. We have member authentication, login, payments, deep dives, other content. And only now when we're looking at things like fast user profiles, for instance, now we're actually trying to like augment that with code. So we've got this far down the line without having to use it. And now we're just like augmenting with it. We're not like rebuilding the whole thing from scratch. We're just adding it in where we need it. So. Also, but I think even if you, let's say you have more of a, because you guys have a really flexible sort of architecture and it's kind of modular, right? It's like you, not everything is all working. Let's say you built something on bubble that was like a whole SaaS product, totally on bubble, 
Um, and then, yeah, at a certain point, you're going to have to maybe like rebuild the whole thing in Rails or something like that. You know, even that I think is uh, is a worthwhile endeavor just because of the fact that you can build the whole product and like a lot of product people don't end up wanting or a lot of times like you have to launch it to learn that there's actually this adjacent market that's the real opportunity you know now you have you have a real reason to talk to these customers and say hey use my product here it is and they talk to them and they say you know i use this and this is worth like 10 bucks a month to me but the real problem i have that's worth like 500 dollars a month is this thing and you've yeah. learned that so much faster and with so much less time energy and money invested uh, if you just build like a no code prototype, then then if you had just like spent six months like coding away and building the perfect product there. So, I mean, yeah. even if you really do hit that, like, okay, well, we have to just like throw this all away and rebuild it eventually. I still think it's a better strategy in a lot of cases. Yeah, I completely agree. One of the, we've got a good question here from um, Dom. It says, uh, a non-technical founder has built a no code MVP, has a few thousand users, as hypothetical. Um, few thousand in revenue per month they're looking to raise uh, to take the product to the next level which will involve a transition to code which they will need to hire for how do you think about this as an investor what worries you about this yeah it's tricky so one of the things that i think investors are really not good at is investing right at inflection points right and it's interesting because i think founders a lot of times invert that and they think like well exactly what i want to do is to be like i built it to this point now i want to do this very different thing and that needs money so like this is the time that i should go and talk to investors is to like do this like er, er, sort of thing and really i think investors you know it's all about kind of reducing your risk or finding the right kind of risk reward profile. So what I would usually encourage folks to do is to try and get on that ramp a little bit, right? So, so rather than saying, I'm totally no code, I've got 3K a month in revenue, what I want to do is go and raise 200K and then go hire a developer, I would go and try to find that developer and try to get them building you a prototype. Right. And so you, instead of it being like a full hard, this is the point you want to invest in, go ahead and get on that ramp a little bit and get like one month, six weeks in, right. You know, something like that to say, Hey, we've got a developer. I've paid him, you know, my, my three K for this month, I've just allocated to, to this developer and, and they're prototyping it. And here's the prototype. Now we need to raise the money to get to the finish line on this. And by the way, we're still going to grow the no code product along the way. That's like really a much better proposition to investors. So that's how I would say, I would say like, try to find the person, try to get them started, try to be able to bring, okay, we've got this developer, here's how far along they are. We wanna raise the money to get across the finish line uh, while still growing the no code product is how I would play that. And, and for me, that would be very interesting. But if somebody said they were right at that moment, it's very hard as an investor to, you know, you, you wanna sort of follow these, these trend lines to say like, okay, I can draw like, here to here to here, you know, and, and if you have these discontinuities, it, it becomes more challenging to raise money. I mean, you can still do it, you know, but that's what I would advise. Got it. Yeah. It seems, it also seems on that, this whole argument, like code versus no code. I think this is just like thinking from the builder's perspective, like our perspective, if you actually talk to, to customers, they have no idea what you're on about anyway. So sure. if you just said, oh, this is build without code, they'd be like, so like oh okay right. even like we think it's cool that it's built without code but if it's if it solves a problem and you can do it effectively it doesn't it doesn't matter either way so yeah it's yeah. Like not uh, arguing on the other side care. yeah customers don't care but the the tricky thing from an investor perspective is how that changes the cost base of the company 100%. right and so, so that's the the thing that you want to sort of be able to show some evidence of is like okay you know you have proven some competency in customer demand and building a no-code solution. Um, if you have proven nothing in terms of the ability to recruit and hire a developer that can build the product appropriately, mm -hmm. that's a big risk because everybody knows tons of non-technical founders who have taken a hundred grand and incinerated it, you know, with some dev agency for something that still doesn't solve the problem. Right. And so that's the thing that is in the back of every investor's mind at that moment is like, you know, you want to make sure that even though the top line is doing okay, you don't just like take the, you know, the cost basis and, you know, and blow up the whole business basically. Yeah. Got it. 
Dan had a new a good question, um, which I think would lend itself a bit to the discussions we both had on, separately with, with Arvid about um, bootstrapping and ideas and um, validation, etc. Says. Uh, no code allows you to be able to build any, pretty much anything. So now the key is actually identifying markets. What would your insights be in identifying a market that would allow you to generate the kind of revenue that Ernest would be interested in? I think uh, Arvid's answer to this on our webinar was to identify, like you said, what's your like unfair advantage? What's your um, subcultures of interest that you have. So for instance, mine would be, I don't know, like no code and like trail running and like I'm a dad. So I'm interested in like taking my kids out like camping and there's all these like sort of like micro communities or interest bases that you have. And I think the best ideas or probably the calmest businesses usually come from these like self interest. So I think that was the th main thing I learned from Arvid's answer, which I think is great. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, and um, actually on, on the MakerPad podcast, we had a good discussion about this, about how no code kind of levels the playing field that for a long time building, you know, tech businesses, software businesses, or, or tech enabled businesses, there was this huge hurdle, which was just like, are you able to build the thing it became this like real challenge. And so if you were the type of person who was able to go out with an idea and raise venture capital and go and hire a bunch of developers that was like a real barrier to entry to be able to to build it so like your ideas didn't have to be that good right yeah. like you know to be like relative yeah. to a world where everybody can sit down and crank out a basic software business or a basic e-commerce site or a basic paid community you know or basic directory site right like um so so it really does level the playing field so it becomes about like i said those two things around differentiation and distribution right can you create a competitive advantage there a lot of that stuff is around you know, underserved niches that people just don't know about. So one of the things I often advise people to do is go and if you have a skill set that's no code, code, whatever, is to go and kind of like be a consultant for a little while. Just kind of like put stuff out there and be like, okay, I'm building tools for people, you know, and just try to find these interesting spaces where people are still willing to, you know, pay big bucks for project work. And maybe there's other people like them and yep. maybe that's a big enough problem that can become a company right that's one thing you know building your own communities building your own audience in particular you know spaces for example trail running and things like that um is another great way to go about it um yeah i mean there's i, I think there's probably a whole laundry list and at some point it's probably worth a lengthy blog, blog post but it, yeah. it, it shifts the the space of competition from can you literally build this to the other stuff around can you grow it can you build something that solves a pain point that people will pay money for that sort of stuff so. yeah and also the building with no code tools as well kind of presents its own issue because you could have like an idea one evening and build it and then be bored of it by the next day and then it just it just goes in the bin so whereas before, if you had like an idea, it'd be like, okay, I'm going to write a business plan. I'm going to raise some money. I'm going to find a developer. I'm going to build it. But then like six months down the line, you've burnt a whole load of money and you're in too deep and you're not interested in it. It's like, oh, so at least now you can kind of build out ideas and test them and see if it's actually going to be something you're going to pursue with like zero cost and minimal time invested. So, yeah. And this is something that I think, folks need to absorb um and, and investors really need to absorb this to be honest but you know entrepreneurs should as well which is that the ability to build stuff with no code or even just how much easier it is to build stuff you know purely with code now really lowers the ceiling on how big a market has to be to be sort of like not just sort of minimally successful but like wildly life-changingly successful you know like there are now just this massive proliferation of niches out there that you can you know basically everybody who could have built a successful blog or newsletter that can get like a few thousand people interested in something can now build like a real business because you can layer on a paid community you can layer on you know um t-shirts and e-commerce and all this sort of stuff and like the basically like the kevin kelly like thousand true fans kind of thing about about musicians it only takes a thousand true fans to be like a um uh, you know, a sustaining musician yep. is now true of just like every audience and niche on earth because you don't need to 
hire a ton of people to build all these products to serve that niche. You can build a paid newsletter, you can build a paid community, you can build online events that you know you charge 50 bucks for, like all this sort of stuff. And then you look at that and you're like, holy crap, we're like three people and we made two and a half million dollars this year. Like awesome. You know? Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, you can also because you can it was almost a case of if you were gonna raise money and hire a developer, you had to have like a big enough niche to be able to justify investing all this money because then you obviously you draw like a you draw a graph you think we're going to earn this back in two years because there's this huge addressable market if you just capture one percent it's like right. now that kind of flips on its head because you only really need like a tiny niche because you could build out like a site um and everything that goes with it within like a couple of days yeah exactly yeah it's a, capital efficiency is the the sort of terminology for it but it basically means it's very cheap to build stuff so you don't need that many customers to really want it before you can build a real business basically. yeah um Jagdish, there's a question can tell you give us some examples of good niches i'd probably say go and listen to um the conversation with arvid go to makeupad.co slash calendar we had a workshop with arvid where he explores like this idea of like figuring out your interests and like how to use them to divide to figure out some niches which may be useful um and interesting to you so that's probably probably a better way to go yeah i agree i i think i made some links here i'm just going to drop these in the chat let's see if all those go through yeah so there's a ton of like showcase things of things that have been built with no code and i think that's really interesting to to sort of like click through and just to see like, okay, what businesses exist out there, you know, that, and, and okay, you, you can see like, oh, I never thought about this one part of the, you know, service production process in this industry, but I have a background in, you know, this works in, in the, you know, world of um, electronic music and DJ stuff, but actually I grew up playing in the symphony and there's the same problems in the symphony, you know, industry and nobody's building for that. Oh, well, I'll go do that. You know, um, you could sort of start to create these adjacencies where you're building the same kind of stuff. And it's, again, to the point of, you know, no code and all of this really democratizes the ability to build the stuff. And so it becomes about the insight, the niche, and the audience, the ability to access them, speak their language, that sort of stuff. Um, and so I think perusing some of these, these niche businesses is, is, uh, it's quite useful and, and can really get the juices flowing on that. Yeah. Um, there's also the one where you can kind of like scour, scour through those niches. So one, one that I helped a friend do is he's like a keen fisherman. So he wanted to like have like a good way of finding like local lakes that had like pictures like available. And most of the people who run these just work off like SMS and there's no, there's all the images are terrible. All the listings aren't in one place. And if they are in one place, they're like outdated and stuff, the site is still not responsive. So it just, it just took like, a few hours to pull some listings and pull them into a nicely formatted like template and there you go there's your little niche niche yeah product. i mean i'll say i i don't want to i have a whole huge list of them but what i i don't want to rattle them off because it's all from like our actual you know deal pipeline right now so i don't want to sort of you know <laughs> like um give anybody any any particular ideas um off this information i have but you know we just every day i see a new person who's like I just happen to work in this industry. I happen to grow up in this industry. Somebody I know works in this particular area, a friend of a friend or whatever yeah. is doing that. And I started thinking about it and saying, well, hmm, is there a product for that? Is there code for that? Oh, actually it turns out, no, they're using pen and paper. They're using, you know, some antiquated, you know, uh, shrink wrap CD-ROM, you know, software that they're just like hanging on for dear life, that it doesn't blow up, you know, sort of thing. And it's not that hard to build like a much, much better solution than they're currently using. It's just nobody is building it. Um, so, you know, usually it's just a method of like, just starting to think that way and observe your life around you and talk to people that you know about like, you hear about exactly that. Like, oh yeah, I went on a fishing trip. Be like, tell me about that. Right. Like, how did you find the lake that you're going to fish in? Like, yep. okay. Like, how did you, how did you meet other people to go with? How do you coordinate all, all the inventory that you're going to bring? Like just kind of asking those questions and then lo and behold, you'll hit on something and you'd be like, okay, that's a big problem. A lot of people have that and uh, it's valuable to them, you know, costs them a lot of time or money or they're paying a human to do it. Um, maybe I can build a, a, you know, a solution for that. Yep. 
yeah, it's like everything's in play with this tool because the cost to actually trying stuff is zero. Yeah. Um, question from Matt. How do you evaluate when an idea or business becomes founder agnostic? Fa founder agnostic? Yeah. I don't know if I understand that. Matt, do you want to expand? We can take another one. Um, Tyler, as an investor, does the consulting productized service product playbook stand head and shoulders above jumping straight in with an MVP? I think productized service is, so, I mean, full disclosure, we invested in a company called Many Requests, which is basically Shopify for productized services. It's essentially like one-stop shop to be able to set up those and charge them and, and um, have your clients put in requests and then you fulfill them and you run your office of uh, all the folks who are fulfilling those. Um, so, so basically putting my money where my mouth is like, yes, I think that is one of the best entry points to online entrepreneurship that exists um, because like e-commerce has got barriers, right? Where you, you know, you need to, um, you need to do inventory, right? So you need to figure out how to do fulfillment. You need to buy inventory, all sorts of stuff. Um, SaaS, you know, you, you probably need to build some kind of code at some point, you know, like I said, you can do some stuff on bubble, but I still don't know if no code tools are, are there that if it's a real pure SaaS business that you want to build, um, you can, it's tough to build more than something that's essentially a prototype that people might pay for still, but it's not really like a full-fledged tool. Um, productized services are things where you can give people real value. You can build a real business, real meaningful amounts of revenue that have margin that you can use to sort of parlay into you know other products um and you can launch them in a day right because most of the time you can fill it yourself so you don't even need to go out and you know hire other people to fulfill it so yeah i mean i i'm a big fan of practice services i think a lot of people should and also it's not zero sum right the one thing about SaaS is if there's already a pretty good SaaS tool it might like take most of the market but most productized services eventually will start to hit the limits of their demand. So even if there's already 30 that are pretty good to be the 31st, well, if there's enough demand, you're fine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm a big fan of those. I think most people who want to get into entrepreneurship should seriously consider a productized service as a way to test demand uh, behind like an idea, right? You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah so going back to uh, Matt's question. So how do you evaluate on an idea or business? Um, no longer needs the founder to run. So, yeah. I kind of think that's eventually the goal of every business, um, you know, to, to invert the question, right? A, a business that is wholly it reliant needs the founder, on the founder, yeah. the pretty risky, exposed business, right? Most of the time um, you want to, as a founder, your goal is to build a business that can continue to operate and innovate that you're sufficiently empowering your team giving them the architecture um such that you know you are not mission critical to to the business um you, you know you still you can balance that to say oh maybe you're still very good and you still add a bunch of value um but you don't want to be a bottleneck on the business early on of course you know every business is like that but i i think every founder should aspire to to hit that point where the business could very well continue serving its employees and customers uh, without you, I guess. Yeah. And this is also like an interesting thing that's come up um, in more recent times and probably the advancement of these tools and automation tools have actually allowed this more and more is these like million dollar, it doesn't, this, the, the figure is irrelevant, but these um, successful one person businesses, which require, minimal input from the person actually doing it. So they've kind of abstracted themselves out of the business and supplemented them like with automation. So there's like minimal hands-on work, but it's ge it's generating enough revenue to be able to like provide like a nice life for the person who creates it. So I think the conversation isn't now always around like building like a multi-million pound, 2000 person business. Whereas in prior times before this it was about like how many people do you employ that was like the benchmark of a successful company i think now it's inverted is like how few people do you employ um and how easy is it um and maybe like remote work is now coming into the mix where you can run successful big like big businesses for the amount of people you've got for fairly like low input across the board in terms of like what it was previously 
Yeah, I, you know, I think I'm a little more, um, I, I don't have as strong a feelings about this idea of, you know, less people. Um, I think people are fine, you know, you should probably, and, and aspiring to employ people and, and give them their livelihoods is, is a perfectly, you know, adequate thing to, to do as an entrepreneur, but it is more about like creating the systems and whether that is employees who are empowered to decide, or it is code or no code that runs automatically, you know, you have the stuff in place that, you know, you as the entrepreneur are no longer reliant to this thing getting from, you know, start to success. Mm -hmm. um, and two minutes, I think a follow-up question, which is what is that point? And I just, I, I don't think it's a point per se. I think it's just an aspirational goal, right? I mean, ideally you have this sort of flux back and forth of, you know, the current operation of the business can run, you know, for the next six weeks without the founder touching it at all. Um, however, the founder is looking, you know, multiple years down the road and starting to carve out that trail and figure out how this next part of the business is going to happen to either continue or adapt to the market or, or grow. And, and they're important to that, right? And then eventually they wanna make themselves irrelevant to that part as well. And you're sort of oscillating back and forth. Um, but I don't think it was a moment where you're like, oh yeah, you know, walk away, you're done. You know, you're not valuable. Because most businesses will probably decay over a long enough time period without somebody taking on that kind of a founder role of trying to keep growing the business, right? I think that's one of the myths of like truly passive income is that it, it has a pretty steep decay in my opinion. If you literally are like fully checked out, not touching a business, you know, four hour work week, blah, blah, blah. You can do that for a year, right? But I don't know many businesses that do that for five or 10 years, right? Eventually yeah. they have a real steep decay. Yeah, market changes, products changes, competitors. Right, yeah. yeah, exactly. yeah. Got it. A uh, question from Greg, uh, Tyler, from an investor standpoint, do you feel that fully remote teams have an advantage or disadvantage for investment, regardless of COVID? I mean, we're biased there. So I don't know if I have an objective opinion about the market, but I have my own perspective, which is I've been building remote organizations for the last decade. Um, I built Ernest completely remotely by, uh, you know, it wasn't even a choice, although it wasn't really even a question in my mind, but my uh, wife works for the State Department, so I built it while I was living in Brazil. Um, you know, I didn't have a deep network of people to hire in Brazil. Um, and so, so we built Ernest completely distributed from day one. And it's not a requirement for us to invest, but just because of, I guess, natural affinity and deal flow and whatever else, probably, I would say 18 out of 20, 19 out of 20 investments that we've done have been distributed teams themselves. Um, so we're all in on remote work. We definitely don't view it as a disadvantage. And in most cases, I view it as a very strong advantage for, um, uh, for, for companies. And I think part of that goes hand in hand with the idea of being a sort of profit focused, calm company, right? Is that I do think if you are you know, raising a ton of capital, you're in an absolute dogfight with a bunch of other venture capital backed companies, there probably is an advantage to being co-located and, and, and changing things minute to minute, hour to hour sort of thing that is harder to do distributed. Um, but if you're building the kinds of companies that we like, I think remote work is a very natural fit for that. You know, COVID aside, obviously COVID has completely changed the game. And one important way that it's changed the game is that you have a lot of companies and, and potential customers that are now putting this kind of thing at the top of their list, mm -hmm. right? Like even if they are not going to be doing remote work in the sense of people distributed across time zones, right? Um, even if they're working from the same city and they're even going into the office on some level, they probably are gonna like want to default to sitting in separate rooms, right? And just creating distance to each other. And if you're in separate rooms or you're across the country, you still need like good cloud-based collaborative, you know, software and, and tools to get your work done. And so what we're seeing is actually COVID, not just obviously benefiting companies that are remote in that they are just not interrupted with their day-to-day, -day, but also customers really prioritizing, you know, switching to SaaS, switching to cloud, adopting new, you know, remote collaboration workflows and stuff like that. And so that's a huge opportunity, I think, for, um, for everybody. Yeah. Like it. How are you implementing this sort of 
um, model and mindset within earnest because we, we touched on this before we, we started um so using the example of you raising your second fund recently how are you kind of making sure it's like reined in enough that it remains a calm business and doesn't start running away yeah that's a good question you know it is funny like we are not as calm as we want to be <laughs> um it is somewhat aspirational for sure because um you know, sometimes it's, it's just, it's a lot of moving pieces, right? I think, you know, uh, a fund is certain businesses naturally lend themselves more towards, you know, kind of calm stuff. I think communities are less calm than a software product, right? You know, because you just have more dynamism going on day to day, hour to hour, trying to get more concurrent action going on, that sort of stuff. And a fund is more on that spectrum of like, I do still need to have like lots of meetings and lots of calls with, with entrepreneurs and um, all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we don't have an ironclad system for it, uh, except just kind of talking about it a whole bunch and trying to you know, culturally encourage that. Um, but, you know, I think it, it kind of, um, a, a big part of it is just, it's an inherent part of the business. So for example, just to get into the weeds a bit here, a lot of funds are built off of a handful of very, very big investors that invest in the fund. And then you take that money and you invest in entrepreneurs. That is a very uncalm way to do it, right? Because you're really trying to get these big fish. It's very much like client work, right? It's like, and if they call you up at two in the morning, it's like you have to take that call because they're going to put $10 million into the fund. And if they decide not to, you're screwed, right? You got to fire two employees if they pull out. Um, we've gone a different route, which is, you know, our second fund has got over a hundred um, investors that are investing into the fund. They are mostly individuals investing their own money in very, very small amounts relative to the way funds work. It's still a lot of money because you know, investing in funds is not for everybody and you have to be accredited and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, but the point is practically no individual investor can make or break what, whether or not we'll be able to continue doing what we're trying to do this quarter. We want them all there. They're valuable, you know, but it's like when you have customers paying you 10 bucks a month, right? And you have thousands of them and no one of them can call you up and be like, you must change your product, wake up in the middle of the night and talk to me about this. It's like, we're gonna do our best, like at the end of the day, if you have to walk away, we're gonna be fine, you know? Um, and so that's part of it is like thinking about how you structure your whole company to be a little more resilient to these kinds of things that can just like ruin everybody's day, right? Um, yeah, got it. We've just whizzed through an hour and three minutes. That feels like it flew by. Um, so yeah. we're almost a good point to wrap it up. I just wanted to kind of wrap it up by kind of summing up like how people should kind of think about building products like the earnest way. So if someone's like has an idea, it's like within their niche, like how, how should they go through this process from here, from like exploring tools to getting their first users, then to potentially taking on and becoming like an earnest company. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, so, you know, if, if you're starting from an idea, um, you know, I think, uh, I, I, look, I mean, this is a shameless plug, but I think MakerPad has a ton of great resources on how to, how to get started, how to try to, you know, map out the landscape of tools that are available, find the right ones that you're going to be able to combine into um, actually, you know, building a product. I also think it's a perfectly viable thing to just like learn to code. Um, I did that. I, that hard. So, you know, you should consider both of those options and, and choose one or both. Um, but at the end of the day, you want to get towards some kind of working um, prototype of, of what you're trying to do. And then I recommend just starting to, to you know, talk to customers and, and get feedback. I would sign up to Trailhead relatively early on in the process. There's a lot of good questions and exercises in there that are valuable from like, you know, there. it's best if you really have an idea in mind. It's not geared towards like, the true mapping the landscape of finding ideas it's more like you have an idea let's like vet it right i wrote a i wrote a post that influenced a lot of this a while ago if you look up tyler tringas meat grinder you'll find like this like series of rapid questions that i call like putting an idea through the meat grinder um that's just like okay does this check all these boxes or is there one of these boxes that like okay well this is an okay idea but actually probably we should toss it out and try again 
Um, so I'd sign up for Trailhead. I would get started there. Um, and then just, you know, try to get some customers and say, hey, and follow along. Tons of great resources out there. Um, yeah. And then uh, Trailhead's a good way to get started. And then we also have an application form, um, to, you know, if you feel like you're sort of ready to um, to get invested. So if you go to earnestcapital.com slash start, that's a great way to sort of route you to the right moment in time where you should sort of start and what resources are available for you. Um, and then, you know, feel free to give me a shout. I'll put in here. I'm Tyler at hey.com and I'm on Twitter. DMs are open. Say, nice. Hey, ask me questions. Always, um, awesome. super happy to help entrepreneurs. And also you are in the, uh, make pad community uh, and in circles so would it be okay if people dropped you a message inside of the community for makeup members sure yeah give me a shout amazing i have actually responded to, to some dms in there um not too many people have been uh, saying hey through that uh, maybe they don't maybe know you're being there. sneaky that's why maybe people don't I know do you there yeah. yeah nice Cool. And if you are not a MakePad member, but you want to learn how to build things without code, then head over to makepad.co and join the wait list. And we invite 30 people every Friday to sign up. Um, and then you can dive into all of the good content and workshops and back catalog of everything. There are 150 tutorials on there. Um, yeah. And start building products without code. So thank you, Tyler, for spreading your wisdom and sharing everything with us. It was great. Thanks everybody for turning up and listening to us ramble on and ask some questions for an hour. Um, we will get this uh, replay uploaded for you at SAP so you can watch it back. But thank you everybody for coming. Uh, thanks again, Tyler, and we'll do it again soon. Yeah, thanks, Sam. This was fun. Thanks a lot. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye.